to have a comprehensive review of Marxism, to go over all of Marxism in the interest of getting a better view of the world situation and the huge problems that we face. A comprehensive review of Marxism is necessary because communism, and especially its revolutionary doctrine, Marxism, is most severely under attack. It arises most recently, of course, because of the collapse of the USSR, but also because of the extreme offensiveness of imperialism in the face of this collapse. Nothing so much symbolizes the lengths to which imperialism goes, for instance, than attacking the small country of Somali and mercilessly bombing it virtually to destruction without there being any public condemnation of it, say from a few organizations perhaps, among ourselves among the first. And also because there is such a very sharp economic offensive against the workers, as we can see by the virtual collapse of the IBM corporations, the world's largest from the point of view of high technology. All of these militate against the working class, and the working class is at sea at the present time. Our problem is how to comprehensively go over Marxism, to restudy it in the light of the present situation, how to draw the lessons of the struggles of the 20th century. We cannot hope to be the revolutionary working class vanguard that we hope to be without paying the most meticulous attention to the restudy of Marxism. All else will be lost. All sorts of activism, however laudatory, however important, will ultimately go by the board and sink into significance unless it is also seen and guided in a revolutionary direction by a revolutionary working class vanguard which works from a world view of the materialist interpretation of history. <laughs> we are at a great crossroads. Unless we take the opportunity to go over all the basic teachings of our teachers, Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky, and first of all Marx, there's no chance for us to compete actively with the bourgeoisie in the struggle for power. No chance for us to be even a leading organization of the workers unless we are armed with new weapons, with a new understanding of the realities of the contemporary world situation. This contemporary world situation is what baffles all the others, including the leading lights of the bourgeoisie. They cannot understand, for instance, why after a, such a monumental victory as, for instance, the defeat of the USSR is collapsed, that plunged into a capitalist crisis which is keeping them mired down. Why, indeed, there is pessimism in the world, bourgeois, ideological edifices. Why all this is going on and is leading inexorably to violent paroxysm throughout the world. We're living in the center of imperialism. 
The rest of the world of, of the working class are bound to look here for answers. They're bound to look here for answers for the simple reason that the economic and political center of gravity has markedly and dramatically shifted to the United States. It is as though this is the last fort, the last stronghold where the workers have not been defeated, have not been mired down in revisionism, have not been mired down by defeats of the working class and the and their disillusionment with Marxism. That hasn't happened because it has never been really a strong part of the working class. It is as though it's still virgin soil to some extent in the United States. But such a huge imperialist colossus as is the U.S. requires a scientific approach to combat it and to ultimately vanquish it. Our study has to be to, in the, on the basis of going over all that we know about Marxism and Leninism and Trotskyism. We have to do this for sheer survival. We cannot shunt it aside. <laughs> and in order to do that, we should, in the interest of consistency and presentation of elementary facts, to take into account, first of all, Marx himself, not so much as a theoretician, but as a practical revolutionary. Marx, of course, is known to all the world as the greatest theoretician of the proletarian movement. He is the founder of the materialist interpretation of history. Rather, he dis discovered it, as well as he discovered the theory of labor value, the labor theory of value. And all of this, of course, everyone knows is to his great credit. And he is the author of the Communist Manifesto, the most popular book in the world, that has outdistanced the Bible in its many pub in its many publications. It has read more often than any pamphlet, including the Bible. But it is often said that we should begin Marx a Marxist study with the basic ideas of Marxism. And that is generally correct. But for our purposes, for the purposes of our party, as a revolutionary vanguard in struggle and in the building of a party, it's necessary for us to understand Marx as a practical revolutionary. For instance, Engels says, in one of his introductions, he says that uh, the Communist League at that time, in the years 1846-47, asked Marx to please write uh, a, a communist, a manifesto to the Communist League, which was then the organization that Marx and Engels belonged. And they sort of invited him to do that. Uh, uh, the way it reads from Engels anyway is that as though Marx and himself were sitting up as along as uh, the Olympian theoreticians and along comes this practical workers organization and asked them to please write a manifesto for them for communism. But it's <laughs> not precisely true or, uh, because it's an example of, uh, of Angus's sometimes over-modest characterization of himself and Marx. The truth of the matter is that Marx and also Angus were both active in the Communist League and in the workers' educational movements and 
France and Germany and Belgium and England, and they were involved in endless factional struggles in which they had to maneuver their way through in order to propound the ideas of <coughs> revolutionary communism, to push the class struggle. They had to maneuver in the struggle against the then bourgeois democracy, uh, of which they were inevitably a part. This is important for us to know. I think that the best way to understand the early history of Marxism is to understand where Marx and Engels were in the days before they formed the, the uh, wrote the Communist Manifesto. And that was the, the revolutions of 1848. It's good to know some of the background of Marx and Engels and of the history uh, of Europe at that point. Now, we're all interested today more than anything in the struggles of the third world and the struggle against imperialism and colonialism and the reaction that the U.S. imperialism is conducting but it would be foolish to say, well, what's the, uh, why is it of interest for us to, ta uh, to suddenly get interested in, in the wars and uh, uh, insurrections uh, in the 30s and 40s of the last century? Well, why do we need them? Uh, after all, Marx did write the manifesto and those wars are gone and, and uh, the, maybe it left no trace of them, the thing that remained is the Communist Manifesto. Uh, but it's important. It's important for us to understand where they were and how they were and what influenced them, see, so that we'll get an idea for ourselves where our party stands and why some of our struggles are uh, uh, though limited and do not necessarily lead in the direction of the seizure of socialist power are nevertheless important in the development of the party. Take this for instance. I said that there was a lot of organizations in the 30s and 40s of the last century in England and France and Germany and Belgium and Italy, see. And Marx and Engels were in the center of all that, see. But at that time, the bourgeois revolution, which brings bourgeois democracy against feudalism, hadn't taken place, see. In other words, the bourgeois revolution to overthrow the aristocracies hadn't taken place except in one country, France. See, in one country. See. And that country, France, had the greatest revolution to date. In every country where the revolutions are studied, in every country where revolutionaries open their eyes to find out, uh, to get a clue as to how their country will go through a revolution. They almost always think of the Great French Revolution. See. Almost always. In Latin America, also in China, everywhere else. There are those who deny the validity of Europe and uh, scorn uh, Eurocentrism and so on, but that's ridiculous. Asia is important, of course. Who can deny that? So is Africa, without any question, in Latin America. But the origins are important. Where it all started and why, see? So they, the great French Revolution, which overthrew the bourgeoisie and startled the whole world. Did I say something wrong? The aristocracy. Yeah, the aristocracy. They overthrew the aristocracy, they overthrew feudalism, they startled the whole world. Starting them in America and South America 
in Russia, everywhere. And the reason why it did it because it was it it cut through feudalism root and branch. It cut it through. And was exemplary to anybody in any country that was looking to overthrow the feudalists. They would look first of all to France. All right. You want if we want a good analogy so we can understand it, Marx and Engels looked upon the great French Revolution the way we look upon the Bolshevik Revolution. It's a real good analogy. We look to it as the model. We look to it, see what they did, what the Bolsheviks did, how they overthrew Kerensky, how they got rid of the landlords and the bosses and bankers, and also how they built the party and so on. And Marx and Engels, like many of their young associates, also looked to, in that direction. Everybody looked for the French as an inspiration to what they want to do. Why were they inspired by it? Why? Because they wanted to have a revolution in their own country. See, that revolution that overthrew the aristocracy in France hadn't come. It had not come to Germany, it hadn't come to Italy, to Belgium, to Hungary. It had, of course, come to England a hundred years earlier. And England was uh, prospering as a, a budding capitalist power. But we're not talking about England. See. So these two young revolutionaries, one 24 and the other one 26, or even younger before they wrote the Communist Manifesto, they looked to it. See, they knew that the one thing they beheaded the king and the queen. <laughs> they did a lot more. And they compared it with conditions in Prussia, and the German states, and in Italy, and so on. <coughs> and they found that the aristocracy had not been overthrown. And they learned from the from the from the French Revolution that it was the bourgeoisie that overthrew the aristocracy. That's what the French Revolution showed. So. From that they learned it, they said this, well, the bourgeoisie here in Germany or in Italy or elsewhere, they're going to have to overthrow the aristocracy. They will have to do it, and when, when they do it, well, somehow we'll get the workers into it, and they will also liberate the workers, since it was the, the French Revolution, that's the way the French Revolution went. See? The French Revolution went from one extreme to another. It took on the clergy first, it took on the landlord second, it took on some of the bourgeois. It went from one extreme to another until the Jacobins seized the reins of power and established a revolutionary petty bourgeois dictatorship, which went far beyond what the bourgeoisie ever thought it would go. The bourgeoisie only wanted to have some reforms. They were not interested in having a whole revolution. But the mass of the people, the mass of these poor citizens, the, uh, uh, the peasants especially, uh, they wanted to go far beyond that. So here Marx and Engels uh, in Prussia, see, and especially in the Cologne district, they were ha avidly studying uh, the French Revolution. Why were they studying it? So were all the other students studying it. Let's just see what, how a revolution could be made in, in, in their country. Nobody denied the validity of the French model. It was so attractive. It was so attractive to the bourgeois because it cut the royalists down completely. It took the land from them for the peasants and gave them the land. See. So, you know, it was a great model. It still served as a model in many ways, see. 
So they look to it to do it, and they figure that if that's the way it happened in France, and so here, see, we have the same nobility, only they're more impudent, they're more divided, they're just as cruel, just as arrogant, they got to be overthrown too. <coughs> well, then there is the bourgeoisie, see. Well, since the French want the bourgeoisie to overthrow the French Revolution, well, shouldn't the bourgeoisie in, in the German states and also in Italy and anywhere else overthrow the aristocracy? Well, they try to follow the model, see. And so it was very much, very much the uh, vogue in those days for revolutionaries, be proletarian or otherwise, to join the bourgeois parties to be in them because they're the ones that are going to make the revolution, see. They've done it in France with great success, see. So maybe that's what we ought to do here. So they don't. And Marx and Engels became very prominent in these, in the bourgeois democratic organizations. Marx became an editor of the Rheinische Zeitung. You can't rely on me to uh, give you any <laughs> name correct. <laughs> I, uh, I took German and I took French and haven't retained a single word. <laughs> well, anyway, they, they, they became the, ed it, Marx became the editor of the paper. But however, instead of propagating just against uh, royalty, he propagated also for the workers and, and also attacked the bourgeoisie. Well, he did it so often and so frequently with such vehemence that the uh, owners who, uh, uh, the bourgeoisie that owned the paper finally told them to leave. Also that the government told them to leave and go elsewhere. And they told them to leave and go elsewhere from Belgium, from France, from everywhere. They were always being expelled from one country to another. And the revolution it didn't come, see. But finally, it was coming, see. It was coming because the old aristocracy couldn't hold on at a time when, for instance, at a time when, for instance, the bourgeoisie was growing. Not rapidly, but it was becoming more more assertive. But as Marx and Engels, who were very intimately connected with the bourgeois elements, they were both from bourgeois families. Marx on one end and Engels from a very rich family, they had innumerable intimate connections with bourgeois radicals and bourgeois philosophers and all that. See, they, that was fine with them, see. So, uh, they avidly awaited the event, you know, when the revolution would start and the bourgeoisie would get at the helm of it, see. And being at the helm of it, they'll overthrow the aristocracy. And if they do, Marx and Engels and the uh, working class organizations along with them will get right in and push the proletarian program to the end. See, they didn't, so it's a very subtle, but at the same time, and uh, it's a, it has merit to it in, in, in anticipating revolutionary developments. Now, there's a lot I'm leaving out that you should read in Riazana's books. It's a good book, but can't do it at once. I don't expect it. I should do it and read it, but this is an introduction, a rough an introduction to all that, see. So they were expecting, see, the bourgeoisie to take the helm, see, and that uh, Marx and Engels, knowing that they were right in the midst with the bourgeoisie, and they they could come and be the editors of one of the central organs, which shows you what power, intellectual power they had, uh, what a rep uh, rev revolutionary uh, re reputation they had, what a literary uh, skill and reputation they had that way that the bourgeois owners of these papers would allow Marx to be the editor. And once having allowed him to be the editor, 
he went as far as he could to promote a proletarian point of view until eventually he was ousted, until eventually they, they had to put up with the censorship and the censorship would always cut out everything possible and Marx and Engels would deliberately send in uh, phony literary articles for the censor to censor and then send the other one quickly <laughs> and so they wouldn't have a chance to censor it. But they, and there was, it was a strict uh, totalitarian state in that they were living in, you know, that word is not used, but it was absolute deceit. But, uh, and the revolutionary elements had to fight their way up. Many of them went to jail time and time again. It was not democratic Germany. It was, it was a s s solid reaction that they had a breakthrough. See? Okay, but then finally did come the rev the these uh, struggle when the uh, it appeared that the bourgeois revolutions would open the bourgeois revolutions of 1848 see they finally would open I, I want to intervene a little bit uh, to say that Marx and Engels through all these struggles and factional lines up with with different groupings and uh, how each of the groups reacted. Uh, some of them were hostile to Marx, some were with him, some had very uh, uh, not only vague ideas, but very anarchist ideas. It, they were very much concerned more with insurrection and conspiracy than anything else. But uh, by and large, just about uh, the year 1847, the Communist League, which was, had been reorganized several times in which Marx was the chairman at one time and another time not, and Engels was in it, they uh, commissioned them to write, they ordered them to write the Communist Manifesto, see. And uh, he, they ordered him to write it on behalf of the League, you know. But the one incident that I'm sure will attract your <laughs> attention as it's fact in mind was that Marx, you know, being very cons concerned with well, how this manifesto would be written and how much he would say in it and so forth and so on, they kept delaying and delaying and delaying. So finally they wrote him a letter and said, if you don't Right, the Communist Manifesto, you'll be expelled. And <laughs> 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 you made the Marxist expelled by the Communist League. <laughs> well, nevertheless, that didn't, that didn't intimidate him. He, he still delayed. And when he wrote the Communist Manifesto, it came out just before the revolution started, see. So it couldn't have influenced the revolution, see. It couldn't have influenced in, in any way. Several days by the time the prints were ready, by the time you start distributing it illegally and so on, it couldn't have influenced them. But nevertheless, they I I influenced. Now, one thing they learned about the revolution and about their, their model of the revolution. As I said, they thought, see, that like the French Revolution, it went, it started off moderately by just asking reforms. And then it decided to take the landed property of the, la of the uh, royalty. And then they took more property from the landlords. And, they, and fr from one group, it went from one revolutionary group to another group until it had reached really a, a semi-proletarian dictatorship of the petty bourgeoisie in 1792. And one leader succeeded another who are all brilliant and remarkable in all history. And they expected that to happen in Germany. But it didn't happen that way, see. Now this is an important point. I think he points this out in this book. I'm not sure it does the way I am doing it. Because what I'm talking to a party, he's not. See, they were anticipating all this to come from the, <laughs> from the uh, bourgeoisie. And when the, Bush, when the revolution started, 
Uh, the bourgeoisie was hesitant, cowardly, not <laughs> wanting to take a, a position one way or another. And they ha got a, an assembly together, and the assembly was like a talking shop, see? They talked and talked, and uh, they never got to the point <coughs> of taking up <coughs> arms against the uh, 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 against the, uh, uh, the Prussian government. They never got to the point. They, 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 they were cowardly, and not because they were so morally lacking in everything. It's because the bourgeoisie was decadent, it, it was ill-formed, and they might have learned the lessons from the French oh, revolution in another way, that they better not do let them s let it all happen to them. See? In other words, they took preventive measures to see that the French, the experience of the French Revolution don't happen in Germany. See? So it's to, it well to be remembered, comrades, that uh, when the revolution started, which is in 1848, it started with the great Paris uprising of the workers. Thank you. In June, and that uprising was crushed in Paris because that was no longer the French Revolution. That was the French bourgeoisie in solid and the struggle against the proletariat. And in June, there was a proletarian uprising, an uprising of immense stature, and the bloodbath that followed, and, and the killing of thousands of workers, is one of the most horrendous developments. And at the same time, it is a glorious way in which the workers fought back. And all of this is so eloquently described by Marx <coughs> in his articles on the revolutions of 1848. Then there started an insurrection. Did, the revolution did come to uh, Germany. But it wasn't the bourgeoisie that started it that way. It was most of uh, the radical bourgeois element, that, not the bourgeoisie proper, in which Marx and Engels were active, and Engels especially acted as a military commander, but it was weak. See, the Prussian, royal, the Prussian royalists, they, they hadn't been overthrown. They were fully on guard. They had probably learned the French the lessons of the French Revolution in another way, but also that capitalist industry was n not fully developed in in uh, in Germany. Now it is also well to remember, without me going much too far, that Marx and Engels spent most of their time in Germany in the industrial areas of the Rhine in Cologne, that, that's where the workers were, see. They didn't go to Berlin, see, which was the capital and the beautiful city and all that, where most of the big politicians did go, but they stayed in the workers' movement there. And that's where all the action was after all. Well, now a question that usually arises, uh, you know, uh, if Marx, if the Rhine hadn't been developed, and Marx and Engels were not uh, were born elsewhere, or were born poor people, they wouldn't have been able to do all the things they did. So I, I, as we see, see, the, the, the most interesting thing about it, uh, in their youth, they were revolutionary, see. They were revolutionary, first of all, against the, ca the, 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 uh, aristocratic feudal governments. That's what happened. See? And they, and they, and that whole generation, see, that whole generation of, uh, of revolutionaries had looked at the French Revolution as a great model, and also because they had an anticipation, which was correct, that this bourgeois revolution hadn't broken out in France, going to sooner or later come to Germany. And it did, but the results were different. 
the results were different. The old Prussian government and the aristocracy, uh, even though they might not have fully anticipated what they did, they did crush the revolution, see. And Marx and Engels were driven out ultimately from each one of the European countries, and they finally settled in England where they uh, began to study, see, the economic situation uh, which they had begun to some extent in the earlier days. Now, I, I think this is uh, kind of important to know before we studied Marxism, is to know how Marx himself grappled in the early days with a revolutionary situation and with trying to understand revolution, see. Uh, if he had, he, if he and Marx had lived in China at the time, they wouldn't have been able to understand that. Or if they lived in Russia, then it was too early. They might have become individual anarchist terrorist group. Uh, but they, but living at the right time, at the right place, they learned a lot. See. Uh, I think when you get to the book, read, read that part of it, which I think is pretty well ex written, but I don't think it, I give it an, uh, far, far more emphasis because I feel I understand him a lot better having, <laughs> we, having uh, understood the Russian Revolution and grappled with it and always expecting a lot more from it and it not coming across. And uh, here they are in Germany, see, thinking that there would be a repeat of the French Revolution. But instead of that revolution going from right to left and more left, as it's in France, it, <laughs> it started off in a revolutionary direction and got crushed. And it never went that much further. See, now, that is one aspect that we have to learn. Now, uh, in the period that Marx and Engels grew up in Germany, there was a lot of intellectual uh, uh, ferment, a lot of intellectual ferment. The university was full of ferment. There was a lot of doubt a lot about the government, a lot of hostility to the government, because uh, the time was right to be against the government. And most of the university students began to look for ways and means of attacking the government. See, like nowadays, the university students are quiet. They're not attacking the, you know, the government or the university heads, and they're not taking over buildings and so on. It's quiet. And at other times, when the students do do that, it's a sign that there's ferment from below, that it's either working class or national oppression that's pushing it, uh, because the students independently as students are not really a force. It's only in the sense that they reflect things, see. See, it's only in the sense that they reflect things. Now students are ones that study. Uh, uh, and they try to pass and try to become either doctors, lawyers, or clergymen, or whatever. But from the earliest days, universities are an attractive pole for opposition in the earliest days. And uh, in examining any uh, ferment uh, at universities or even at high schools, we can hear the uh, storm from below coming. And it's good to understand that, not to overrate it, of course. See, not so many years ago, they, the students at Columbia University didn't want to pick up their diplomas, and they made a great fuss about the rector of Columbia and the head of the Columbia University expel Key Martin from it. <laughs> so those were different days that heralded a, a world struggle all around. But a lot of times it is quiet. And so during Marx's time, about the same thing. 
See, only over there they faced real persecution, see. Years of imprisonment, all of them. Years of imprisonment, punishment, and severe punishment. And nevertheless, see, the revolution did come, but it didn't come, it didn't come the way it was anticipated, and it was aborted, see. So that it took many years to, for the bourgeoisie to finally come to power, and it didn't fully come to power until 1918, after the, the imperialist war, and after uh, the revolutionary uprisings by the Communist Party led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, so that the bourgeoisie didn't come to power in Germany fully until the 20th century, until after the imperialist war. Up until then, they were the tools of the old landed aristocracy, which held on firmly to the levels of power and also made all sorts of compromises with the industrialists who were very much satisfied with having the royalists at the head of the government. Now, some of this is all very necessary to understand, but where do do, where, and all this sounds very, very good for Marx and Engels, a revolutionary activist, but what about the theories? Where do they get the theory from? In all this maelstrom of endless activity and agitation, where do they get the time to do all the theorizing? Where did, where, where did it come from, see? Well, in the first place, you take Marx himself. He comes from a pretty cultured family, and uh, when he got, got to the university, he, he was studying, uh, he studied law or on some other subject, and uh, was very, very, was a very assid uh, assiduous, he was very, uh, very serious about his studies, see. And uh, Engels, on the other hand, he comes from a very religious background. He also came to the same university, see. And he also studied very hard. But at the time that they, they were studying, and which was before the real ferment began, what the students were gravitating to, which shows you every place, they were gravitating towards philosophy. They took up philosophic studies, uh, probably because it was the only avenue where there was debate. See, you can, uh, you can take up the religious courses and the scientific courses and so on, where there's no debate. This is my own conclusion about it. But whereas in philosophy, there could be debate. There could be a lot of debate and so on. And so one of those who was popular at the time was Hegel, H-E-G-E-L. You'll come across this guy. <laughs> take you a lot of time in studying it, see. See, uh, uh, and, uh, and the students at that time gravitated to studying it. And one would wonder why in the world they would be so concerned with, <laughs> with him. He was a monarchist. If he was a monarchist and all that, I mean, why would the students be so much concerned with him? That Marx studied him, followed him very faithfully his, his theory of, of, of dialectics and angles too. And a lot of other students, they, they went, they went there to study Hegel and dialectics. But why in the world would they want to do that? What? Because he, Hegel, was the proponent of the theory of change. That's what that's what dialectics is. <coughs> to put it very, very clearly. Change was the important thing in what Hegel was studying. Well, well, whatever his philosophy was, 
whatever his ultimate his ultimate conclusions were. His philosophies permeated with change, constant, uninterrupted change. Change from quantity into quality, so on and so forth. And the students were most attracted to it. So why were they attracted to dialectics? Why were they attracted to change? You're going to be able to study that, and I'm sure we all should study that. But most important reason politically is that change is what they were concerned with, to change the government. <laughs> See, it wasn't any abstract interest in change. It was that <coughs> if you study change, if you study change, you're bound to come to conclusion that the real thing you're concerned with is to change the government. And that's what we were concerned with, see. So that, but Marx was more concerned with just the change in the government, see. He also was concerned as to what this philosophy meant altogether, see. For all these years, The general consensus among historians and philosophers was things are always more or less the same, see. One day only differs from another on the calendar. Things do not change. This dialectic approach heralded a, a new method of viewing history altogether. See? That you view from the viewpoint of constant uninterrupted change. Now if you do that, see, well, it, it, it is an advance, certainly. It's a great advance to know, especially if you've seen the French Revolution. You've even seen others, see, so that you're imbued with change, whereas if you take the uh, uh, the older view, where everything is more or less static, ossified, like the pyramids, constant. So it's only in the revolutionary period that they finally developed dialectics. I shouldn't, however, say that it was the only t time. The ancient, ancient Greek philosophers also saw constant uninterrupted change, but it didn't necessarily make up the philosophical system which was ultimately developed by Hegel, see. Now what did Marx do with this theory? Why was he so interested in it? He was interested in it because it, first of all, because it was philosophically and historically seemed to be proven correct. That he had studied history. He had seen feudalism and slavery and different modes of production and different constitutional and political governments, one followed another. So that it is true that all that is, is continually changes. As Trotsky shows in his, in defense of Marxism, he says, uh, you take two loaves of a sugar. See, they look, they both look the same. But you look more carefully with a delicate scale and you'll see that they, they weigh differently. And they are really different. Or you can take even two twins, two twin children, and you look carefully and you'll see that they're not exactly the same. And there's hardly a measure which they can, you can, even when you get a measure and you measure them, it's still a question as to whether the measure itself could be that accurate. So that does always change, constantly, never ending. <coughs> but that's one aspect of uh, the philosophy of Hegel. His political views were not concerned when they are reactionary. 
but there's a lot to dialectics, and I'm sure that you can go over it. I, I, there's no point in me going over the uh, transitions in, in Hegel's dialectics. I think that uh, will take a especially long time for us to study it, but just to mention it, see. Now, what is it that Marx did with it that changed the world, see? He, he had synthesized it together with the, the materialist interpretation of history and made it into dialectical historical materialism. See, instead of seeing only logic and only seeing shadows constantly changing and so on, he saw the real world. He had studied history. He had studied ancient Rome. He had studied even Asia and parts of Africa. He see they changed and then all there were classes and class struggles. And so he took <coughs> the idealist philosophy of Hegel together with whatever he learned in Feuerbach on, on materialism and, and synthesized it into materialist interpretation of history. That's the greatest discovery that has ever been made <coughs> in social science. See, up until that time, it had always been regarded that society was here because God made it so. He brought it on. But Marx was the first one, and the first correct one, to apply science to society. See? Applying science to chemistry or to physics or to mathematics, all this to Bush was he agreed to. But to say that you can have a scientific view of society, why that was outlandish because it goes against religion. It's God created it all. Maybe not, not Jesus Christ and maybe not Mohammed but uh, other, also other gods, all over, it's God everywhere. But Marx showed otherwise, see? He said that society could be analyzed the same way that you analyze other physical phenomena. And he applied it, and that's the materialist interpretation of history. Marx was the first one to apply a scientific criterion to the development of society. And thereby got a handle on explaining <coughs> the various phenomena in life. Now, if that was not, the, and that, if Marx had done only that, as Engels says somewhere, it would have been enough to establish him as the greatest of scientific thinkers the world had known. But he also developed another theory, and that is the labor the theory of value. <coughs> In other words, the source of capitalist profit. And here, we want to stop. <laughs> it's enough of one introduction. Okay.